Our guest today is Stan Gibson, corporate executive turned author, entrepreneur, speaker, and success coach. Stan's become a sought after speaker throughout the U.S. for his message that both inspires and engages others to greatness. Stan's a longtime corporate real estate executive with over 35 years of leadership with Fortune 500 firms. His ability to mix and communicate strategies on the athletic field and the business world are timely to all leaders wanting a reset, quote, at home and in the workforce. Stan and his company, Oxygen Plus, have a zeal for well-being as a consultant helping businesses, leaders, and their teams go through transformation and positive leadership training. His passion for leadership inspired his best-selling book, Living a Rich and Intentional Life. Stan's been married for 40 years, and he and his wife share a passion for servant leadership and a contagious spirit of enthusiasm. Stan Gibson, welcome to Next Steps Forward. Hey, thanks, Chris. I'm pretty excited. I guess I need to update that bio. We just celebrated number 42 uh, two weeks ago. And uh, the fact that we, uh, my wife and I met in third grade, I guess I can add about another uh, 15 years onto that. So, uh, but anyway, I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward. Let's have some fun today. No, we're going to have a lot of fun. Before we start, my, my listeners and viewers know that I'm an avid, diehard sports fan and they, they know my teams, and they know what I bleed. So I just want to shout out with a little, how about them Cowboys? <laughs> how about them boys? It's our year, right? Every year is our year. <laughs> So Stan, you spent 35 years as part of the leadership in several Fortune 500 companies, and during that time, you became a self-described, quote, avid researcher of the neuro and physiological science, helping leaders create abundant energy through sleep, nutrition, exercise, mindfulness, productivity, routine, and healthy relationships. First, tell us about your corporate journey, and then share how your interest in wellness and well-being came about and what you learned from your research. Sure, Chris. I'll tell you what, my journey... Um, like I say, I was in uh, I was in the corporate real estate world for close to forty years, and so um, asset management, uh, investments, portfolio strategy, you name it. And um, you know, I, I've really uh, while real estate was kind of kind of my thing, leadership became what I really got passionate about, and that happened about ten years ago. And so even though I was still working in the corporate world and I was working for, and I don't mind mentioning, Wells Fargo, 300,000 people, a huge, you know, Fortune 250 company, um, I really got passionate about leadership. And I started doing the research, the neuroscience, and the, all the things that leaders need to do to show up at their best. And so, you know, I, I, I took that path and I was doing it, as I always said, on my own time, my own dime, working before work, after work, weekends. And I just developed this passion. And it just came about three years ago that, you know, when I exited the, uh, the corporate world, uh, that, again, it was a smooth transition. And I love it. And I love talking to, to, to executives about it. I love talking to emerging leaders. I love working with companies and organizations. And it's all about transformation and growth. And that's my jam. And, and uh, that's, that's what I love most, Chris. That's your jam. I love that. So before we go any further, do you still have any senior contacts at Wells Fargo? I do. <laughs> awesome. Because you mentioned their names, so I give them a call for some corporate sponsorship. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so how do you define wellness and well-being? You know, for me, it's mind, body, and soul. Mind, body, and soul. And, and I really believe that, you know, that comes to a personal choice for everybody. I don't push my, my preferences on people as far as from religious as aspects or things like that. But I do believe that people need to take care of their mind. I do believe that people need to take care of their body. And I do believe that they need to explore, you know, what, what, what life is all about, you know, whether it's, it's purpose, uh, whether it's an afterlife. So I believe that those three things become very important in what I call living a rich and intentional life. And as you research the different dimensions of well-being, did you decide that one of them, whether it be physical, mental, emotional, or social, is more important than the others? You know, it's funny you say that, Chris, because you know what, if, if, if you talk to most people, they'll say, well, you know what, you, you got to exercise, you got to eat right. And, you know, and, and, you know, sleep is so important and they are, and we'll talk about those, but I will tell you that I I've worked with leaders and, and, you know, we can work on those things. We can work on the physical aspects and science will tell you that you'll live 20 to 25% longer if you work on those things. However, relationships, the emotional piece. I never realized until I got into my research, but the longevity of your life, having healthy relationships actually adds 60 to 65% onto your longevity. So, so, so to me, that really was a big wake up call for me in helping clients say, you know, if things aren't going well at home, 
they're probably not going well at work. And if they're not going well at work, they're not going well at home. You got to get the whole picture right. And a lot of it starts with relationships, Chris. When you talk about things going right at home and at work, and that's the, your, sort of your perfect storm, what are some other common barriers that prevent individuals from achieving optimal well-being? Well, I don't believe enough people, you know, get into routines and, and good habits. You know, we make over 30,000 decisions a day, Chris. And, you know, from the time we wake up in the morning, we just, you know, it's, 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 you know, you know, what am I going to wear? What am I going to do? What path am I going to take to work? It, trust me, it builds up. And most of those decisions are made by about 4.30 or 6, 6 o'clock in the afternoon. And that leaves uh, nothing but Doritos and Cheetos for the rest of the night <laughs> and uh, binge watching, you know, anything just to be mindless. So I, I do talk a lot uh, to a lot of clients about habits. Um, I think habits are, are more important than discipline. And so I, I believe that a lot of people really need to work very hard on uh, putting some very uh, good habits in their life to almost be on autopilot. And I think that, that that's something that, uh, you know, I love to talk more about. Now, we often hear that we're our own worst enemy. How can we overcome those barriers and cultivate a greater sense of well-being in our own lives? Well, you know, we, uh, there's a lot of coaches out there and I'm not talking about me. I'm not talking about personal coaches. I'm talking about, you know, there's technology that can coach you now. Uh, you know, I'm talking about wearables. I'm talking about, you know, I don't know if you've ever worn the whoop W H O O P. Uh, most, uh, all NBA players wear them. All PGA players wear them, uh, on the, on the golf tour. Uh, it, it will basically give you every, uh, every, every metric taking place in your body. And the thing about it is um, those metrics, uh, every morning then you can answer, you know, a journal of questions. And over the course of a month, it can tell you, uh, you know, you probably were in red that day. You weren't getting enough hydration. You were probably in yellow because you weren't this. So there are wearables that can help coach you. Um, I've wore the Whoop for a long time. Then I went, right now I'm uh, using uh, the Garmin because uh, they have a similar one. Uh, there's the Aura Ring. And actually I just read the other day that Samsung is coming out with a ring. And I just put in my newsletter that, yeah, your next engagement ring may be uh, from Samsung. Uh, <laughs> a lot but, cheaper. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what says I love you? Like take care of yourself. Um, so anyway, it's uh, uh, there's a lot of things that you can do um, you know, to take care of yourself. And, and the one thing that I always say too, you know, our body, we have what's called an autonomic nervous system. And, and, and within this, our system, within our body, we have two chambers. You know, we got the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. And the sympathetic is, is really, it's that, it's, it's that stress. And there's two types of stress. There's distress, which we don't like, and Nutris, which, which, usurous, which is positive stress. You know, it's that first date. It's that getting ready for something that, you know, just we need, Chris, a certain amount of stress in our life. We really do. Or we'd be sluggards. I mean, we'd be sitting on the couch all day. But the parasympathetic is the recovery. And, and so there's a lot of things with nutrition. There's a lot of things with sleep. And you need a healthy balance of both recovery and stress. And when I was talking about the whoop, when I was talking about uh, uh, the Garmin, when I was talking about the rings, they measure what's called heart rate variability, which is my number one metric that I look at, because um, what that does, it measures your sympathetic and parasympathetic. It measures how well you're treating your body. And obviously you want to be in green and you want to have a number that is positive. Um, and it's, it always depends on kind of your age range as to kind of what that number is. But that's what I believe. I believe we can take care of ourselves, Chris. We don't need to rely on somebody else, although it helps to have a coach and have, and have someone keep us accountable. So we're going to go off script here a little bit because I know that you kind of like to do that. I'm in financial services, not corporate real estate, but more on the, the banking side. You were corporate real estate for 35-ish years? Plus. Okay. I know a handful of folks in that part of the business. Your energy is something I've never seen or felt before from corporate real estate. No offense to anybody in corporate real estate. I, I can imagine how boring it is, especially post-COVID when buildings are closing. But it's just like this whole aura and vibe coming through the, the Zoom screen here. Like, what's going on? And so, like, how'd you make that transition? What's What made you make that transition? And sort of what keeps you going every day with this this high intensity, this high level? Uh, you know, that's a good I've never had anybody ask me that, but I think it's a great point. And, uh, you know, I always said this. I always said, you know, uh, I really look, when I, when I work with individuals, we, we really take a look at their personal makeup. I mean, you know, we're all wired and fired in a specific way. 
And I always said, you know what? The one thing about me, the, the reason I survived 35 to 40 years in, in the corporate world, and I was also an entrepreneur. I had spent a few years in there starting some companies and things like that. But the, the, the thing about, about me was I'm just wired and fired that way. I was never the smartest guy in the room. I was never the guy that uh, had the real estate solution that everybody said, oh, my God, why didn't we all think of that? But my gift, my wiring, my uniqueness, my genius was typically getting the right people in the room. And when I came to the understanding that I had a gift of of enthusiasm, of getting the right people, uh, connect, I call it connecting dots, uh, uh, connecting uh, dots and connecting people. I do that very, very well. And I realized that that gift didn't need to just be harnessed within the real estate world. I could have been in the, the trash hauling business. I could have, you know, picked any business and, and, and my gifts become very ubiquitous along the way. So, you know, the one thing I always had was I had strong teams. And I, my last, I had a team of 15 people. We had global responsibilities all over the world. And I had that team for 14 years. I didn't have anybody leave. And we had some very challenging uh, uh, personalities, which is what made them so great. They were one of the best teams, I think, at Wells Fargo. But it was that ability to, to uh, realize that they're the ones, they're the experts, they're the geniuses, to have humility and say, you know what, if I can just take your ideas and communicate them to the C-suites, that's my gift. And I'll give you all the credit for it. And so it's it's that kind of awareness, personal and self-awareness that I think everybody has to have. We've all got a swim lane, Chris, and we just need to find it. Yeah, you know, I want to highlight that again. You know, realizing that you're not the smartest person in the room, but maybe more importantly, acknowledging it is something that's not easy to do just for personal bravado, ego, whatever. But it's so important. That's something I learned early in my career. Um, you know, President George W. Bush always said that. He's like, I'm not the smartest person in the room, but I'm going to surround myself with those people. And I think that's just a great life lesson in terms of knowing your strengths, your weaknesses, to your point, what lane you're in and what channel you're in. And then I don't want to use the word exploit, but then just build upon that in terms of leveraging your strengths with the person on your left strengths, the person on the right, and the person in front of you. And then co collectively, you're a lot stronger. Yeah. You know, I like, it, it, I like it, it, and you know, you, you said you don't mind going off script a little bit. No, please. But back in the late 1960s, uh, Dr. George Lance was asked by NASA to find geniuses. We need geniuses to get in a small little piece of metal and go to the moon and come back. And we just need, we need people that are creative. They can think in the moment that are just awesome. So he created this assessment, Dr. George Lanz. You can look it up. He created this assessment and he did something really unique. He gave that assessment to preschoolers. And lo and behold, Chris, they scored a 98% on that thing. Because you know what? Think of yourself when you were in, in, in you know, second grade, third grade. I mean, you, you know, you were uninhibited, you know, on the playground. I mean, I can tell you, I not only threw the pass, I caught the pass. I mean, I was all over the place. And, and when I looked at, you know, I had nothing holding me back. And, and, then, and then, you know, Dr. George Lanz gave that same assessment to those same kids, 1,650 kids. He gave it to them when they were 11 years old. And now they scored 15%. And then he gave it to some random people when they were 30 and they scored at 2%. So we lose our creativity over time. We lose our genius. And I always tell people, you can be the Michael Phelps in your swim lane. You can win that swim lane by five one thousandths of a second every single time. It's an unfair fight if you just know what you do best. And Michael Phelps knows what he does best. And if you get him into a, 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 a something other than the breaststroke, he might come in second or third. So keep in your swim lane. Know your swim lane. And so I work with a lot of people on what we call the genius uh, spark. And, and in fact, I just worked with a real estate team uh, out of a company, um, global team, about two weeks ago. And we did that very thing. We looked at everybody and identified their genius. And when they all sat down, you know, we're all used to, you know, what's strong, not what's wrong. We're all used to getting beat up. And when they all looked at their genius and they started to look around the table, of course, we were on a Zoom because we were all over the world. They started to acknowledge it. And they started to say, you know, I, I see that, Chris. I see that in you. Now, now I get it. I know why you are so strong. And then we took those same strengths, those same things that make them a genius. And when we're under stress and duress, they become kryptonite. And I call it good stand, bad stand. And I want to be good standing. 
85% of the time. I know that bad stand's going to be there 15%. Just ask my wife. She might even challenge that number. But, <laughs> but I want to be good stand 85% of the time. And I want everybody else to be 85 to 90% of the time. And I want you to have awareness, especially as a team, when that kryptonite comes out, because it's not malicious, Chris. It's not malicious. It's the way we're wired. It's the way we respond under stress. And so when you know that, then you know what we can coach and how we can go ahead and, and get around some of those stressors in life. So anyway, I didn't mean to take you off it. I just think it's a, you know, the whole genius thing is, 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 is obviously a very excitable topic for me because I think everybody's got one and you should have seen the faces light up on that team last week. And, and it, it was just like I threw some magic pixie dust across the, the Zoom waves and, and everybody was like, ah, now we get it. And that's what starts trust. That's what starts trust on a team is when they have that awareness. Well, you just said a lot of things that I want to go over again, which was just amazing. So I'm glad we're going off script. You talked about genius. I don't think most of us are told, I know, and certainly not me, that there's genius in you. You go to work, you do your job, you stay in your lane, you punch the clock and you go home, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. But what I love what you just said is what's strong, not what's wrong. That's amazing. You know, and you talked about kryptonite and figuring out your strength and your weakness. You know, one of the things that we focus here on the show is resiliency. It's one of the, the pillars of strength of the show. You know, and resilience is so important to success and optimal well-being. How do we build emotional resilience to cope with life's challenges and stressors? You know, again, I think know who you are and know who you're not. And, you know, even working with teams, I can work with some people and we can tell right away. Uh, they're just a hotbed for stress. Um, they are going to, and, and you know what? Uh, one of the gifts in Strength Finders is called Achiever. And if I told somebody, you know, quit achieving, quit, quit, quit being that person. Well, no, you don't want to take that genius away from them. But I will say this, um, we have to work very hard at what can be the antidotes for, for, for these stressors. When you put three or four of these strengths together, let's just say achiever. Uh, let's just say uh, you've got three more. There, there's kind of a quadrant uh, of four quadrants. And, and one of the quadrants is people that get a lot of things done and they're always active. And when people have two or three or four of those, they're typically going to burn out. So just knowing who you are and knowing who you're not, but when you know that you've got, you're the type of person that you can't sleep until you've got, not only did you check all 10 things off the list, you're going to create an 11th and 12th. When you start to know that is when you can start to say, you know what, I need some help. And sometimes it's meditation. Sometimes it's breathing. Sometimes it's a lot of the different things that, you know, I help executives with to slow down. And then there's other people that have very different types of stresses in their life. And so it really comes down. It's, it's very hard. It's very challenging. It's very customizable as to what helps people relax. What makes me relax, Chris, may not make you. And so that's why we look a little bit at the kryptonite and, you know, we start to get some ideas as to what can you do different to slow down? What can you do different to get that recovery? Because obviously your distress is out of whack. Your eustress there's not enough of it, but your recovery is something that we've got to look at. And every recovery is different for everybody. For some, I tell you right now, I work with a guy who's just, he's a supercharged uh, individual and, and, and his recovery is actually working. I mean, <laughs> uh, but we've got to change that. You know, is it working on your business or is it working on a hobby or something else that's related? So it's very customizable, Chris. I was laughing when you're talking about, you know, executives and people having their list of 10 things to do. And then all of a sudden they get 11 and 12 and 13. And last night, my wife and I didn't connect until about nine o'clock. So we're at the kitchen table, just recapping the day and they're like, okay, let's get ready for bed. And she comes up and she's got her list and she's adding to, I'm like, put that thing down. You're not going to be able to unwind. The list will be there tomorrow. I promise you. And so I can empathize, sympathize all of that. So I, I appreciate that analogy. You know, Stan, sometimes we like to blame genetics as a reason or excuse for something in our life. You know, I blame my father for my receding hairline. I thank my mother for my blue eyes and my height. And, you know, I can't help it. But I got bad genes, my mother's fault or my dad's fault. How much do genetics contribute to our well-being and how much do lifestyle choices and environment contribute? 
Well, it's funny that you say that uh, because uh, you're absolutely right. You know, we've all got some baggage. We've all got, you know, a mom or a father that, you know, they did too much. They didn't do enough. They did this. We've got something in our childhood that kind of created uh, a lifestyle or, 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 or a way that we feel like we're wired today. Um, I'm a very big believer. You've got to make a choice, Chris. Are you going to be a victim or are you going to own? You've got to take ownership. You know, we can be a victim all day long. It's not going to change the future. If it does, it's going to be in a negative way. You've got to make that decision. Am I a victim or am I an owner? And when you take ownership, then you start to make some conscious decisions. And one of the things that I talk about often is, you know, we have these parts of the brain. We've got the amygdala and people have heard of that because that's, you know, fight, flight. And, you know, uh, it, 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 it's an area that a lot of us want to live in, in that I would say out of 3000 things we take in a day, probably 95 percent all go to the amygdala. But the other part is the prefrontal cortex. That's the part of logic. That's the front part of the brain. So getting things to move from, from the amygdala to the prefrontal cortex, there's a word called the reticular activation system. And that is a, that, that, that's within our, 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 our brain. And it helps us take things and put them in the conscious to where we can think logically about them versus just believe everything that everybody tells us. Chris, you're this, you're that. We take it and we it becomes truth. Until we can bring it to the prefrontal cortex and put a conscientious note around it, that, that's when we can start to do something about how we want to show up. And that's what I teach a lot of clients is that, yeah, we can do a lot of the genius spark and we can figure out how you're wired and fired, but how do you want to show up? That's going to be very important. We're always getting advice to change this or to change that to improve our overall well-being. In your experience, what are a few of the top practical strategies or habits we should adapt to enhance our overall well-being? Well, I'm a big believer. Again, let's go back to habits. I'm a big believer in morning habits and evening habits. <clears throat> uh, you know, morning habits, uh, you know, I, I, I always say that the best leaders need to be a little bit selfish to be very selfless. To be a selfless servant, you've got to take care of you in the morning. You've got to take care of that first hour, hour and a half has to be yours. Because when it is, then you can serve everybody else the rest of the day. Not to put a downer story on this, but I will tell you, you know, this became firsthand to me back in 2018. And the reason it did is because when my, my wife was diagnosed with cancer and, and, and it was a very sobering event for us and, and, you know, a lot of tears, a lot of this. And, you know, again, are you going to be a victim or are you going to be an owner? What are you going to do? And so for me, I knew that my life was going to change because I had to take care of her. And I had a group that, you know, we managed over $2 billion worth of real estate and I had other commitments. I couldn't do that, Chris, if I didn't take care of me first. I had to be a little selfish. Mind, body, and soul. Mind, body, and soul. Every morning when I get up, and I got up a little earlier, and I was up by 5, 5.15, and I was taking care of the body. I was taking care of the mind. I was taking care of the soul. And my wife was doing the same thing. And, and, and fortunately, you know, uh, this is... Uh, from 2018, obviously we're, all, we're almost six years later, and, and and you know we've had ups and downs through that time, uh, but but right now you know we're going through a good time, and so you know it's one of those things that that we as leaders, the world will go on without us, it really will, and it always has. However, while we're here, and we want to take care of the people that mean most to us in life, we have to take care of ourselves, and I really believe that. I really believe that. And so that starts with morning routines and evening routines. And I'll just give you a, oh, just a quickie here. Uh, morning routine, 10, 3, 2, 1. I quit. Uh, uh, sleep is very important. Sleep, and we'll get into that. I know we'll probably go off script here, but sleep is extremely important. It's a foundation for health. If you don't feel good, you're not going to do things well all day long. So you got to get that good night's sleep. But 10, 3, 2, 1. So, you know, I quit any and all caffeine 10 hours before bedtime. You know, it takes about six to eight hours for it to kind of flush through the system, but 10 is a safe number. And so, you know, I, I come noontime, I just, you know, coffee's done for the day. Any, 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 and that's the only caffeine I really consume is in coffee. So I shouldn't be having my coffee now? I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that, Chris. I, I All mean, right, fair and, enough. And, and you know what? Especially with your to-do list, your wife, I, I, I'm starting <laughs> to see a pattern here, Chris. <laughs> but, but, and then three hours before bed is, you know, we try to make sure that, you know, we've already eaten, um, no wine, no nothing. You know, people always come home and they say, oh my gosh, and they've made those, those 30,000 decisions, 35,000 decisions. 
And they come home and they say, you know what? I just want a big meal. I want a few glasses of wine and it's eight or nine o'clock. And they think that puts them to sleep. Well, they don't go into the four cycles of sleep when they do that or the four stages of sleep. So three hours is when we start to shut down. Two hours before is typically, uh, you know, technology. You got to shut it off at some time. You know, it's just not doing your brain any good. And there's another thing called digital dementia, which we could get into, but you've got to shut down the technology a couple hours before. And then an hour before is typically, you know, the lights are getting lowered. You know, we're trying to introduce melatonin. There are certain things that I do to introduce melatonin into my body. Um, I've just started drinking um, uh, a little bit of tart cherry juice, which has natural melatonin. Uh, there are certain things, raisins actually produce melatonin. Um, but there are certain things that I talk to clients about in, in getting the melatonin right uh, so that so that you can then go into sleep. And I want to tell you something about melatonin. Melatonin helps you get to sleep faster, but not longer. So it, it, it's really a great way. If you have a hard time falling asleep, it's one of those things that just helps you get to sleep a little quicker. But, but those are those are some some morning routines and some evening routines. And I really didn't hit all my morning routines because I go through about five or six things when I get up in the morning. But that first hour to hour and a half, that's all about Stan. And the reason it's all about Stan is so that the rest of the day can be all about sharing my wife, those that I work with, my clients, and everybody else, being a servant leader. Stan, Jordan, my son, the engineer, is telling me we've got two minutes to break, but I'm on page two out of page eight of my notes. Is it okay if we skip the break? <laughs> Let's do it. All right, Jordan, we're going to blow through the commercial. That's all right. So you talked about sleep. We'll get into that in a little bit more. You talked about diet and exercise for your overall well-being. You touched a little bit on tart cherry juice and melatonin. Are there specific nutrients that most people are missing that they can improve upon themselves or should just work with a nutrition coach? Yeah, I, you know, there's not enough micronutrient uh, doctors around, in my opinion. A lot of the people you go to, they'll take your blood test types and they want to sell you, you know, $300 worth of vitamins a month. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to judge, uh, but that's just not my thing. But, but uh, I think people that can really test your blood types and know that there are what works for me. Uh, Chris may not work for you and vice versa. Some people need a little more protein, uh, you know, just because of their blood type. Some people need more carbs. Uh, so, you know, I try to regulate it a little bit with just, you know, good vitamins. Uh, there's turmeric. There are certain juices that I drink. The raw stuff, a Mediterranean diet, I just try to keep it pretty simple because it isn't until we start to ingest this Western diet that we have that we start to get in trouble. And, you know, even in this Western diet, you know, so much of our food has been diluted, Chris. I was talking to somebody last week. He said that he was talking to somebody extremely credible, extremely credible. And he said, we need to consume over 200 carrots to get the same amount of nutrients that one carrot gave us, you know, 20 to 30 years ago. And so we have gen genetically modified a lot of the way that we grow uh, our meats, our vegetables, et cetera. So, you know, getting a, trying to eat just as pure as you can, again, I, we can get into more on nutrition, but, but, you know, intermittent, intermittent fasting, certain things, but I just try to keep it as pure as I can. And my wife and I, yeah, a Mediterranean diet just seems to work well for us. And I don't know that we've ever got the right answer. When we're so busy with work and family responsibilities, and obviously so tired afterward, what's the best or easiest way to do what we should be doing with both? If there is a best or easiest way. So, so restate that with, with what? When we're so busy with work and family responsibilities, and then we're just exhausted at the end of the day, what's the best or easiest way for us to do what we should be doing with both to make sure that neither ball is dropping and falling and we're doing the best we can at work, the best we can with our family, like I said before, they both affect each other. How can we as, as individuals, as couples, make sure we're focused on, on doing the best job we possibly can given the limited kind of window we have of them overlapping. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, I, again, I truly believe in intentionality and you've got to have intentionality. Your calendar becomes, you know, very important. And I get into systems a lot and I get into calendaring things. I mean, my morning routines are calendared. If, if they're not calendared, you're not going to think about them. But I tell you what, even my date night with my wife after 42 years, that's calendared. Uh, you know, you've got to uh, compartmentalize everything in your life and calendar them. And, and, and I don't want you to become a robot. But on the other hand, I want you to th really think about, you know, again, morning routines, night routines, you know, uh, recovery time, uh, you know, Saturday, blocking that out or Sunday, whichever is your Sabbath, you know, but you've got to be very intentional 
about your calendar. And so um, I'm very big into that right now. And I'm working with some, uh, some, some expert consultants out on the East Coast who's even notching my game up uh, even more considerably in this area because I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in, in not only consuming a rich and intentional life, but helping clients have a rich and intentional life. And a lot of it just comes down to basically, uh, you know, seeing the week ahead. I always say this, Chris, uh, to, you know, tomorrow starts tonight. Next week starts this week. Next month starts this month. You've got to be planning and you've got to think ahead. And we get so busy that we just kind of go on autopilot and we've got to take the time. And everybody's got a favorite time. Mine was Saturday morning. Saturday morning for you know an hour to have coffee before everybody got up. Look at what I'd accomplished the past week, what I want to get done in the next week, and think a little bit. But you've got to have intentionality. I really believe that's important. Like Ty said, next week starts this week. My phrase similar to that is tomorrow never comes because it's always today. Yeah, absolutely. Great point. So, Great point, Chris. I absolutely agree with that. So Stan, we've talked about physical and mental well-being. How do social connections and relationships contribute to overall well-being, and how should we nurture and cultivate meaningful social connections? Oh boy, I'll tell you what, we are just getting so diluted. And, and you know what? I, hey, I'm a I'm on social media. I'm not a prude. I mean, I, I I like that stuff too. But when I talked about digital dementia, you know, we are spending so much time on social media today. And digital dementia is a real thing. I mean, it, it affects short-term memory. It affects, uh, it can affect actually your gut health. It affects a lot of certain things. And I think you've got to be very, very careful about how you spend your, your, your personal time. Um, that's, that's, that's probably the easy answer. Um, but, but I really believe that we've got to be somewhat uh, consistent in how we dial that stuff down. How do we keep more intentional about the relationships we have in our life? And as, as I mentioned, uh, you know, one thing I do, and this is kind of interesting, is I will have people tell me, give me the five or six things that are most important in your life. And they'll go ahead and they'll jot them down. And then I'll say, okay, let's talk about now, let's take those five or six things. How much energy do you put into each one of them? And I want it to equal 100%. Well, you know, people always lead off and say, family's my most important, blah, blah, blah. And it's getting absolutely 5% because it, they get what's left at the end of the day. You got to be intentional about it. Now, when I talk about time versus energy, now I can't give my wife or my family or my grandkids, I cannot give them the same amount of time I give my business, but I can give them the energy. When I'm with my grandkids, there's nobody else around. There is no phone within sight. And we're having a blast. And I told you, I'm grandstand to them. And we are having a wonderful time. You've got to be intentional about the various areas in your life to keep your relationships and emotions alive. Let me tell you about relationships and just real quickly. They say you can die of a broken heart. You really can. What happens is when you go through trauma, either a bad relationship, you've lost a loved one, you're going through a divorce, your blood, uh, your, your, your veins start to constrict and it's hard to get blood to the heart and to the brain. And when that happens, you really do. Right now, uh, you know, I lost, uh, my, my mom lost her, uh, her, her, my stepdad about three weeks ago. And I'm most concerned about her being lonely right now because that is a time when they say, and she's got a bad heart anyway. Well, that's a time when, again, we start to forget a little bit more. We, that's the thing about relationships in, in, in the blood. You start to forget a little bit more. You don't get enough uh, blood to the heart. Uh, you really can die of a broken heart. And so you've got to be very careful about your relationships, nurturing those that are good, and removing or alleviating those that don't serve you. I want to go back to the digital dimension you talked about, if that's okay. Sure. So, you know, I'm not a big social media guy. I post stuff kind of when I have to, mostly for the show uh, or interesting articles on a couple of the topics I think are important to me, uh, human trafficking, mental health, suicide prevention. I'm a big Apple fan and I live, you know, with my Apple watch and my phone and I pay attention every week on Sunday. It gives you a recap of how, how much time you spent on your phone. And so I try and reduce that every week. Good and I've got my wife who, what I call doom scrolls with her thumb, she's lefty. So she's your left thumb and just doom scrolls through whatever social media feed she's on. And I'm like, you've got to stop this. Now, 
I've got three kids with my wife. My oldest is 21. My middle one will be 18 soon. And my little guy just turned 12 last week. They all went through COVID and had a different perspective of how they got through COVID. Mm. Social media was what kept them engaged. Uh, Zoom was how they went to school. Uh, TikTok became a thing. You can't Google mental health in teens right now without seeing the biggest flag of social media damaging and, and causing harm to their mental health. And we haven't gotten to that 10 year window yet where Harvard Business School is gonna do some case study on you know COVID-19 and social media with teenagers. How do we address that situation in terms of, yes, social media is, is a thing that's with us now and will be going forward. That's how we communicate, that's how there's advertising. But in terms of your overall well being and managing that, any suggestions in terms, of, and I know it's not sort of your typical work, but any suggestions you could have for our listeners and viewers in terms of how to address that with that, that age group that went through school throughout COVID? Yeah, well, first of all, and, and it's a great point you make. First of all, it's got to be a choice. It's got to be something that you want to manage. If you don't want to manage it, you, you know, I could tell I could tell my family, you know, hey, cut it down. And you know what? Unless it comes from them, unless they can see the science around it, then they maybe will start to understand, maybe I should start to manage this a little bit differently. But they've got to understand the neurological effects. And again, it does affect gut health. It does affect uh, uh, the ability to uh, uh, short-term memory. It does affect a lot of different things. And if you just want to Google chat, uh, GPT, I, I, digital dementia, and take a look and see what the effects are. And, you know, there's enough science around it to say we need to dial that back. It, it's something that, uh, you know, if, if, if the government thinks by getting rid of TikTok that we're going to quit uh, <laughs> Uh, looking at social media, they're just going to double down on something else. Yep. And so I think you've really got to be very careful about, you know, there's a lot of great apps, for example, like the Freedom app. I don't know if you're familiar with the Freedom app. It's one of the many, but the Freedom app, and it will cost you, but it's a great, you know, you can dial in, it will shut down certain apps or certain parts of your computer or your phone during the day. And I'll tell you what, it feels like you're naked running around and you can't get into, uh, you know, uh, Facebook or Instagram or TikTok. But I have used that in the past to start to dial me back on being and you can't get in. It's locked. I mean, even if you want to cheat, you can't get in. And so it's it's, it's really there are apps out there. Um, I also hit uh, do not disturb a lot. Um, I have really started making a very conscious effort, even on my computer, of hitting unsubscribe to a lot of stuff because again, it's just one more clickbait and people know how to get you, Chris. Yep. You know what you're after. I mean, all of a sudden I can, I can say, you know what? I've really been looking at a certain car. We could just call it a Chevy something. And all of a sudden everything I look at is an advertisement for a Chevy something. So don't think that people aren't out there trying to get, you know, the majority of your attention. And you've got to just make that conscious choice that, you know what, at the dinner table, boom, we're not going to have it. It just isn't going to be there. Um, in the evening, we're going to shut it down two hours before bed, and we're going to hold each other accountable. So I don't have a great suggestion. All I know is you've got to make that choice, and you've got to understand the science around what it's doing to you personally and professionally. I'm laughing about the, the clickbait. Uh, so my son's starting his Little League season now. And last weekend, we went shopping online for new cleats at one store, new batting gloves at another one. Monday morning, I go to wallstreetjournal.com, and what are the two banner ads I have? <laughs> batting, the batting gloves. And the cleats store, I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. So I've got one more discussion point on, on sleep. I know how important that is for you. So now I work from home, so I may be able to do this, but although my kids and wife would probably call me out. But do you recommend daytime naps? And if so, it might be possible for someone like me that work at home. But how do we get the boss to buy into that if you're in the office? Yeah. Uh, whew. You know, I, number one, yes. Winston Churchill took a nap every day during the war. So, I mean, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. Um, and, you know, I don't believe in, in naps going over 30 minutes. Uh, I think that, you know, you want to get in. There's four stages of, of sleep. And I think you want to get into just past the, uh, uh, the awake and light sleep, start to dream, and then come out of it. And I think then all of a sudden you've got the equivalent of a two- to three-hour nap uh, and getting your sleep. I do think it's great for creativity. I do think it, it, it creates quality over quantity. The problem is I'm not a great napper. Um, you know, you can tell, you talked about my energy. Yeah. You know, how do I slow this, this machine down? Um, but you know, there are other things that you can do. Uh, there is, uh, um, you know, meditation. You talked about the boss. Uh, yeah, they might, they might look at you a little funny if you're in there, uh, with a pillow, 
But I will say, if you can go find a quiet place and just plant your feet and just sit and just, I'm a big believer in, in breathing, uh, you know, box breathing. Uh, box breathing is nothing more than, you know, picking a number four or five and inhaling through the nose for the count of four or five. And I always say through the nose because the, the nose acts as a filter and there is a certain uh, uh, nerve in your nose that basically when you breathe through it, it expands your lungs even more than breathing through the mouth. So breathe in through the nose. And if you're, let's just say it's a count of four, breathe in heavily through the nose, a count of four, hold it for the count of four, breathe out through the mouth, the count of four, and hold that for the count of four. If you have anxiety, um, always go to breathing and just do that multiple times until you start to feel the anxiety come down. There's nasal breathing. There's what's called the Wim Hof breathing, which I have done before, which is quite amazing. Uh, but there's a lot of different ways I think that you can slow down without having to take a nap. And then uh, Dr. Uh, Huberman, uh, he has, a lot of people are familiar with him, but he talks even about um, there's a meditation in the day. You don't really go to sleep, but you start to focus on every aspect of your body, all the way from your feet to your knees to your, I mean, you work through your whole body. And by the time you go through this 15 to 20 minutes, you are so relaxed. You haven't slept, but it's, it's the equivalent of two to three hours sleep. So there are different ways of finding ways to relax as long as you calendar it and choose to say, you know what? I want my afternoon to be just as awesome as my morning. And so you've got to make that decision about a nap. And, and, and since we're talking about it, I, I would just say this too. When it comes to calendaring your day, uh, typically morning is going to be the green area for most of us. That's going to be the time when, you know, where we're ready to work on the bigger projects. And then, you know, we kind of slide into a little yellow where we get tired. We slide into the red where we're just, you know, uh, we just want to do mindless stuff. I, you know, an email, anything, just, 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 just get me through the day. And so I think you've also got to know that, that, you know, keep, keeping that yellow a little later in the day by taking a nap or by meditating. Or, or, you know, I even drink, uh, you laugh at this, but I even drink beet juice in the morning because it, it, it has a neurological, it just wakes you up and it takes you deeper into the day than you normally would. So there are ways to keep your energy levels high, Chris. You touched on meditation in the quiet rooms and we're going to shift gears a little bit here. So I've seen recently a lot of major financial services firms on their floors adding meditation and adding quiet rooms. You're a corporate executive. Let's talk about the workplace. What role does workplace culture play in fostering our well-being or stifling it? It plays a huge role. It plays an absolutely huge role. And it starts at the top. And, and, and you know, whether it's a walking meeting, whether it's, you know, creating these, these, these meditation rooms, whether it's, you know, the water. Uh, you know, we need hydration. Our body is made up of 80% plus water. So, you know, I think the corporations play a huge role in, in, in how we take care of ourselves. I think that, uh, you know, sometimes the filler is to put in a gymnasium or give a gym membership. Well, you know, the 20% of the people that use it are the people that are already in shape. And, and, and so you've got to really take a look at what's the return on the investment of the things that you do. And I know this is going to really weird a lot of people out, but even with me as a manager, um, maybe it was because I was well-versed in it, but I think I can, can help other managers become well-versed too. I talked each week to, you know, my direct reports. How are you feeling? How are things going at home? You know, what's, what's going on? With, you know, you, you're getting plenty of sleep. You're doing this, you're doing that. And not that I can solve every one of their problems, but A, it showed I cared. And B, I could give them enough things to think about to where it started with me. It wasn't relying on the organization. And that's a low cost, no cost way of helping employees take care of themselves. And again, it has to be a choice to where people want to take care of themselves. But as a manager, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So you take that time. I, I'm a big believer in, in either weekly or bi-monthly meetings, not only with your direct reports. Uh, we call them skip levels, whatever you want to call them. I, I met with people, two or three uh, positions were removed from me, and those might be 30 to 45, every 30 to 45 days. But keeping engaged and showing people you care and talking to them about their personal life is just as important as understanding what's going on in the workplace. So I do think that the workplace plays a huge role 
in how we construct the way that we try to keep our employees healthy. We've talked about your research of sleep, nutrition, exercise, mindfulness, productivity, routine, and healthy relationships while you're researching your book, Living a Rich and Intentional Life. What was the most surprising thing you learned during your research? That I could actually write a book. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, you know, I guess, you know, as, as I went through it, Chris, it, it's my why, my why had to be bigger than my why. And, and, and what I mean by that is why I was writing the book had to be bigger than my what. Um, I had been doing a lot of motivational speaking, a lot of speaking around the country for the last eight, nine, 10 years, even while I was at Wells. And people said, you got to write a book. You got, you got to put this stuff into a book and, you know, never let a good pandemic go to waste. Um, you know, all of a sudden I had a few hours that I wasn't playing sports or doing something crazy. Why don't I put that into writing a book? And the most compelling thing was, you know, my mom's up there in age, she's now 90 and, and, and she, you know, she really just wanted to see me write that book. She wanted that day where I would deliver her a book. And that became my why. And so that's what, that's what motivated me to, to, you know, chunk out two hours before work, two hours on the weekend, two hours after work. And, and, and it put me on a path because my why became bigger than my why. And now I'm able to use something that I can give to clients and say, you know, hopefully you can get some nugget out of here that makes you your best version of yourself. And so I think you got to have a why. The research that I did, it was a lot of stuff. It was accumulation of stuff that I'd done over 10, uh, 10 plus years, quite honestly. Um, but yeah, I think, I think your why has to be bigger than your why. And I just love the research. And uh, I don't know that I want to write a second one. I've had a lot of people tell me that I should, but writing one was uh, pretty laborious. And I would rather speak than write. But uh, anyway, that was, my, that, that, was, that was a lot of fun. I will say that. I spent one year writing it. Uh, right there with you. It was a, uh, a COVID thing for me too. I wasn't commuting to New York three and a half hours a day. So I understand your, your joy and your sorrow through that process. So Living a Rich Intentional Life is your first book. There will be another. I know that. I know you. I know your energy. Where can people find your book and where can they find you if you want to come speak? So they can find the book, again, Living a Rich and Intentional Life on Amazon. But they can always go to my website and my website, which, yeah, I just changed the name of my company. So it's, it's not Oxygen Plus. We just changed it actually to StanGibsonSpeaks.com. Stan Gibson Speaks. And, you know, I, I was somewhere a few, few months ago and somebody said, Speaker Speak. And I thought, that's what I do. And that's what I need to brand myself. So Stan, StanGibsonSpeaks.com. You can go there and you can actually watch a uh, five minute, uh, what we call a sizzle reel on me speaking. And if I'm your jam, then you know what? Uh, there's a place to hit a button on there and say, hey, Stan, can you, uh, can you come and speak to our company? Can you come and speak to our organization? Can you come hang out for a day? Um, I just love meeting people. And so anyway, um, that's, where you can, uh, that's where you can find me, StanGibsonSpeaks.com. And I'd love to hear from you. So early in the show, we were talking about rings and Fitbits and, and all that good stuff for your, your physical well-being. What productivity tools or apps do you recommend for managing tasks? You talked about calendaring, scheduling, and collaboration. Well, number one, um, I, I, being in the corporate world, you know, it's meeting by de yeah, death by meetings. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I, I literally was in meetings 90% of the time. And I will tell you, I left a meeting 15 to 20 minutes early because I was already double booked for another meeting. And so your mind, it takes 21 minutes to basically, anytime you're interrupted, it takes 21 minutes to go ahead and either get back to the topic or get hooked into the new topic. And, and, and so I'm a really big believer in asynchronous meetings, Chris. I believe that, that apps today allow, especially younger people who enjoy it more in the, you know, Gen Z, millennial they love as asynchronous meetings because they're not afraid of technology. And so you can call a meeting, we can call a meeting and I might answer, you know, give, give you an answer at 10 o'clock. You might give me an answer at one o'clock. I might respond at three o'clock and you've got some time at five o'clock. Anyway, we somehow figured out the solution to a problem without having to schedule a 45 to 50 to 60 minute meeting. So I believe a lot in, in, in asynchronous, asynchronous meetings. The, uh, the thing that I would, would, would say with asynchronous meetings, uh, you know, whether you've got Salesforce, whether you've got Trello, whether you've got uh, Slack, uh, you know, there are a lot of different systems out there today that will help you create 
asynchronous meetings. Uh, Notion is the other one. And so, you know, I'm playing around with a lot of them right now, too. I'm playing around with Notion. I'm playing around. I have started using Trello. Uh, I do use Slack with my vendors or, my, my, you know, the people that support me. So I think there are great ways of, of having meetings without getting killed with uh, death by meeting. <laughs> so obviously you're a success coach. Who do success coaches listen to or work with for their inspiration and personal success? You know, who coaches the coach? <laughs> well, you know what? <clears throat> I would be a hypocrite if I didn't invest in people to coach me because um, I ask people to obviously invest in me. So, you know, I've, I've had everything from a business coach. Uh, uh, at the same time, I had somebody who actually, uh, she was wonderful. She, she coached me at the same time, but she taught me something very different. We got into ontology, which again, is this, is this science of how to show up and how does your brain work? And, and so, so, you know, <clears throat> you've got to make that conscious choice of, of, you know, do you want to be coached? Do you want to continue to learn? And I will continue as part of my uh, business plan. To, I'll, I will continue to invest in me. I will continue to invest in me uh, every year that I'm alive. And I believe that that's what people have to do. Now, I still read books. I still listen to, to podcasts. I have a newsletter. And one of the parts of the newsletter is what Stan reading, listening to, uh, uh, or doing. And I'm always throwing a documentary out there. I'm always throwing a book out there. I'm always throwing, I just have an insatiable desire to want to learn more. And so I think that that's very important that you have to make that decision to, to always uh, uh, either invest in you, invest in a coach, read, do the things that excite you. And, uh, you know, I, I, have, uh, I have no regrets. I, I, you know, my, my coaches have been really, really awesome. And they have lifted, there's been a great return on that investment. Stan, guests always have the final word. And we've got three or four minutes left. You've already shared some very practical and uplift, uplifting advice. So maybe it's a matter of summing up everything or maybe you have something else to add. But please take us into our conversation with advice to help our audience become less stressed, more resilient, and more empowered. Well, you know, um, when I talk about living a rich and intentional life, Chris, you know, why do we wait to get sick to get well? You know, why do we wait for some, you know, some really, you know, horrible event because we haven't taken care of ourselves our whole life to decide, you know what, I wish I'd have taken better care of myself. Uh, I'm not trying to make this quick, but I was, my wife and I were having dinner about 12 years ago. And this is when I decided to get into coaching. Actually, we were having dinner and, you know, one of my very close friends walked up and he, you know, we, we hadn't seen him in a couple of years and had a great conversation. He walked away and then he came back over and he said, you know, I feel like I need to tell you this, but he said, I've got cancer. And he said, I've got a 50, 50 chance of living for five more years. And I was like, you know, my jaw dropped and I didn't know what to say. And before I could get anything out, Chris, he said, no, 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 no. I didn't come over to make you feel bad. I wanted you to know that, that it's been the best three months of my life. And he said, you know what? I'm having conversations with my wife that I've never had before. He said, I have now, he's, he's a CEO of a company. He said, I've now assumed chairman and I promoted somebody into being CEO that's really better at it than I am. I've taken all my kids on separate vacations and said, what do you want out of dad? before he leaves this world. And so to me, that was where I had kind of the idea around writing a book called Living a Rich and Intentional Life. Because, you know, when death becomes certain, life becomes rich. When death becomes certain, life becomes rich. And he said that to me. And that resonated. And that's what I would ask those of you that are out in the audience today, is to not wait to get sick, to get well. Take care of you now. It's a great journey. Every season of life is awesome. And enjoy the season you're in right now and make it the best. Stan Gibson, author of Living a Rich and Intentional Life. Thank you for so much for being us today. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Been my pleasure. Thank you. You've got a wonderful program. Love uh, your audience. And again, StanGibsonSpeaks.com. Just love to hear from you. Take care and do live a rich and intentional life, please. And thanks to our audience. I'm Chris Meek. We're out of time. We'll see you next week. Same time, same place. Until then, stay safe and keep taking your next steps forward.